Hey. Hey, how's it going? Hello, Good. everybody. Hello. How is the uh, daylight saving time treating you? <laughs> Enter seasonal affect disorder. <laughs> it's real, I, isn't it? I do struggle with it the first couple of weeks. Mm. I don't like it. Yeah. Did it, it feels anybody like wake midnight. up at like Oh, sorry. Yes. I was just saying, no, it feels okay. like midnight at like 5 p.m. I'm like, is it like 10 p.m.? You know, it just feels like hours later. Oh, you guys, it's 8.30 here. And so I feel like I'm in a cave of darkness. Like, why, yeah. why am I up at midnight? What's going on? <laughs> so, yeah, the daylight saving stuff is for real. Hi, everybody. We'll wait just a minute or two if anybody pops on. And then I think we'll start with a quick meditation. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, a little three minute reset. So Paula, I feel like you're the expert in this. Is it now standard time? It is now standard time. And in I was summer, just- It was daylight time and right. now it's standard time. Right. Okay. Um, and I was just sharing with Jothi at least, and who else, Gretchen maybe, that at least for the United States, you can drop the initial in between the location and the word time and just do like ET and PT and CT. So that way you never have to worry if you're saying the right thing. Great. That sounds like a smart way to roll, especially in terms of like marketing and PR and social media. Right. So yeah. the things you learn. <laughs> 40 years into it. Right. Also, I just read that Arizona and Indiana, Hawaii. Too. Oh, Indiana too. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's confusing because Indiana is in the middle of so many states that do. They stick to one. Okay, so Barb, you need to leave a little early. Thanks for letting us know. And Jyoti's listening. She'll be on camera soon. We have a few folks hopping in. This is great. Why don't we start with a sit right now? Just to kind of get quiet. And then uh, we'll go from there, okay? So I have my bowl. I'm hoping you can hear it. Uh, we'll see what Zoom wants to do, but if you just want to find your comfortable position, we'll get quiet.
I'm sorry. What? I'm sorry. That's okay. Do you have these on your phone? What? The cameras. No. Okay. Yeah, right. my husband you. does. Right, yeah. I'll jail call and come to you. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you, everybody. It feels really important to me that we start with this because I feel like this gathering is um, a once a month opportunity to kind of dial down to why we do any of this and, and the ethics behind it and what it means like to put those ethics and the heart of hearts that is behind what we do here with Studio B uh, into praxis, into living, breathing, embodied, um, daily work. So for anyone who was able to attend in October, thank you. Um, if you weren't able to attend our last session and you're here now, thank you. Um, this is an ongoing conversation full of really rich topics that we will not solve in a one hour call. So um, consider this an ongoing opportunity to co-create our most authentic and most ethical version of ourselves. And as always, it's a conversation. Um, this is not me leading the pack. This is us um, really in dialogue. So please jump in at any moment and know that this is your time as much as anyone else's. So we're gonna jump right into the agenda that we had last month and we got about halfway through um, and did have a really rich conversation. And I'll walk you through a little bit of what we, um, had left there. And then we're going to talk about a few more practical things for the next month or two. So I'm just going to share my screen to let you see where we left off. And um, last week, we kind of closed with talking about what does it mean to co-create a protocol for what is right now a majority white collective that is teaching Eastern practices. And we explored what are our policies for teaching Buddhist practices as predominantly white teachers? And how can we share these practices that are maybe also Hindu and Taoist and Jain in a way that feels um, very responsible and respectful, non-colonial and accountable. And part of what we discussed is this practice of starting to name our lineages. So where the practices we each individually teach come from 
and explaining why we use the language of rituals that we use um, so that folks can feel a sense of authentic belonging so that they can understand why we chant OM at the beginning of cl class if we do or um, what the Sanskrit name of that pose might mean and, and why we use it. So we talked about options like each of us creating a video in less than a minute that could live on our social media pages or on the platform itself that would offer an introduction to who we are and, and why we teach what we teach. And uh, we discussed that a little bit in the notes from the last session. But something else that we, we didn't quite get to finish talking about last time was what's the impact of not naming those origins? are the sources of those practices that we're sharing, especially when we are a predominantly white team. Um, what does that mean? What kind of environment does that create? Um, what kind of message does that send? I know there are plenty of um, yoga and mindfulness spaces that very consciously have divorced themselves from the lineage behind them, an effort to secularize and in, I think, a fear of alienating folks, we're pretty clear that that's not our operating model, that we do um, really prioritize staying connected to lineage and articulating that. So um, we can talk further about this. I'm gonna move down to the next question because I think it's related and then we can jump into that. So something we've touched on a little bit and we talked about in the last meeting was what and how is it appropriate to adapt or modify our teaching content for corporate classes versus public platform classes, both of which might be serving a totally different audience or require a, a different style of teaching. And in that sometimes tricky project, how can we show up authentically? How can we show up as ourselves all the time, not compartmentalizing ourselves into um, Rachel, the spiritual practitioner, for public platform classes, and Rachel, this secular mindfulness teacher for a corporate class. Um, and what are any barriers to this that you might be feeling? So I wanna stop there and make sure you all can see each other and just see if anybody has any thoughts or reflections on that. Uh, hey, Rach, hey, everybody. I'm just thinking about um, lineages that we're consciously separating from because of abuses within those lineages. So just naming that, I mean, I think that we've all studied with teachers or adopted and adapted practices that perhaps um, don't have a lineage that we want to be associated with. So I think in that case, um, and, and for whatever reason, but, you know, typically, I mean, especially with some of the sexual predators in the yoga world, for instance, um, I think it's important to also name that in that case, um, you have our full support. You know, if, if you're separating from a lineage that you've been trained in um, and you no longer want to be associated for whatever reason, um, just know that we support you. And certainly we're here if you wanna to talk to us about that or, or are feeling challenged by any of that. So um, I, that's really all I wanted to say. I hope that helps. Hi. Um, uh I think for me, the complication sometimes arises more around when I'm recording practices than when I'm teaching live. When I'm teaching live, I'm very clear on who my audience is and how I might need to show up most appropriately in terms of language and the way that I'm offering different adaptations or modifications. When I'm recording something, um, it's a question mark who's gonna come at various points in time because content lives as long as it's on the platform. And so it becomes um, more nuanced of like how I'm using language, what types of postures I'm guiding um, into when I'm creating the recorded content. Especially because right now we know that most of the people that are on the public platform happen to also be corporate, primarily corporate people, but that may not always be the case. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Those are all really great points. And Jen, thank you for bringing up that lineage separation factor because I've I'm seeing it happen a lot right now. And it's absolutely something we are behind. And I think something that is okay to articulate as well um, in terms of teachers being transparent about why they're leaving that lineage. Um, there have even been scandals in the last several months. I mean, they just kind of keep unfolding, don't they? So maybe it's a reminder to all of us to um, honor the lineage, but not get our fingernails stuck in clinging to the lineage mm -hmm. because of the ways in which um, they're constantly evolving. Right. And, and, and that's not to say that that's not also happening in the mindfulness space and Buddhist communities, Dharma teachers, you know, it, 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 it has happened. I mean, there have been really public um, separations too. And, and we're not saying that you have to do that either. So that's not certainly a requirement. Um, I think it's just important to note that, um, you know, it, it, it's going to be a very individual, um, it, and there's lineages that have had leadership, you know, uh, that very controversial, very public, uh, discussions happening, and they may still be very committed to that lineage and that's okay too. Um, I, everyone here, I, I feel confident in all of our teachers and facilitators that um, you're operating in the most ethical way. Um, and if we didn't think so, um, you know, certainly we, we would talk to you about it. So um, I don't want anyone also to feel pressured that if there's been a controversy that's that has happened or come up and you're still operating within that lineage that you're you have to separate that's certainly not true okay it's kind of like so so i'm going to just say one more thing so um it's, it's almost as if i i would never want to be judged because the sins of my father right like that's that's just True. So we have to operate singularly um, and speak in a way that we feel confident and comfortable in, in this scenario. And recognizing that abuses of power are likely interwoven in the history of so many of these practices, mm -hmm. and that it's an ongoing practice in pulling out what is life-giving and in uh, stepping away from what is not and in bringing this decolonial consciousness mm -hmm. to the new iterations of the practices that move through our bodies into the world, you know, being a different vehicle for those teachings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think open dialogue is, is where kind of all of this can be worked through, right? Having, you know, so I, I, again, going back to the affinity groups that we were talking about, the sharing circles, I know we're having a meeting, having a meeting tomorrow afternoon. I'm excited about that. Um, you know, maybe perhaps we could even have topics once a quarter that are, you know, a little edgier and that we could flesh out, you know, how we're feeling and what we're thinking about, what, what we're learning about, just kind of amplifying the fact that we're we're structuring conversations that are difficult and that no one has an answer to, um, but there's a willingness to flesh it out. You know, I'm wondering, um, like in terms of what Jyoti mentioned, sometimes I know it, it, there can be pressure to bring some of yourself to one setting or maybe some of yourself to another setting depending on who you're creating content for and i'd love to chat uh, sort of on a, on a greater scale about if you feel allowed to be authentic right now if you feel you're able to bring your full self or if there's anything that you need or um, could benefit from in order to really bring your whole self and your your history um, with you when you teach. One of the uh, 
ideas that Jessica shared in our, our last meeting was, you know, think of Studio B as an artist. What is our art? What are we offering? And I think part of the project of creating, you know, the kind of art that moves people is that authenticity, that freedom to be real. As content creators, as teachers, is there anything else you feel you need right now that you're not getting or that doesn't feel safe? Are there any barriers to authenticity? All right, cool. Well, if you want to think on it too and share later, that's fine. Um, why don't we jump further into where we left off with the agenda? So something that I want to talk about today because it is November, 2021. And one of the topics we talked about last month was the fact that when we first created this platform, um, we set some bold goals uh, for a platform that would be 50% uh, BIPOC and LGBTQ plus teachers as of last December, and 67% by this December, which is in 22 days or so. And we're not there yet. And I know this is something that is often on my mind. Um, and it's something that we want as a collective to put a lot more energy toward in continuing to build and expand a representative faculty so that both teachers and students um, feel they're in a, a welcoming, diverse and truly representative space. Um, so something we had talked about in uh, the past is maybe proactively expanding that representation by investing in training new teachers, especially teachers who may not otherwise have the financial means to do so, but whom we identify as potentially excellent practitioners and teachers of integrity. So um, that said, you don't have to do it right now, but if this paragraph brings to mind someone uh, who is in your, your studentship circles or your teaching circles, um, please send, and, and if you think they might be interested in what we do here at Studio B, please share their names with me or with Jan or Sarah or Paula. And um, we would love to use that as one way in which we can um, help support teachers in becoming faculty members with Studio B, whatever that requires. Um, and that might include offering trainings at a discounted rate or scholarships so that these teachers might be able to complete their training and then come on board almost uh, in an apprenticeship model of sorts, but then moving into full faculty members. So I'm gonna stop there and, and see if anybody has anything to add on that. Um, I have to jump in five minutes, Rach. So this is a little off, top, off topic, but relevant. Um, because the structure of our community has changed so much in the last year, I think what would be helpful in order to tee up this initiative is to update the teacher um, and facilitator handbook. Because a year ago, we, we were operating very differently. Um, now that the, the foundation of the cooperative isn't changing at all. Um, as a matter of fact, I think it's a more robust um, community with, with so many more opportunities than there were a year ago. Um, but we wanna reflect that in like in telling our story, especially when we're, if we're going to start recruiting again. Definitely, thank you, Jen. All right, guys, I'm going to jump to my next call, but it's really good to see everyone here. I'm really proud of the participation we're having in these groups every month. It's really important. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks, Jen. All right, bye everybody. Yes, Barbara Ann. Um, 
I am still thinking about the first question that you posed. So I'm sorry to be a little bit out of order. You're perfectly in time. Okay. Um, that is such a challenging question. You know, I was thinking, okay, if I have a medical condition, I don't necessarily share that with people, but it doesn't make me ungenuine. And when I think about why have I committed to teaching? Why, why do I feel so passionate about it? And it's because my experience has shown me and people have told me that meditation and yogic movement alleviate suffering. That's why I teach. So many things that I know about, let's say mindfulness meditation or Hatha yoga, uh, they have uh, correlates in science. And for some students, that sort of background, you know, like that they could lower their heart rate or feel more relaxed uh, and why this works, you know, what the, the functions of the brain, things like that. I struggle with, is that okay? If I teach that, is it okay? Because it does make people feel better. But inside, inside what I'm looking for is how can I evolve spiritually? And um, I know that a lot in my teaching, I don't necessarily allude to any lineage. But I sort of kind of go in an easier door and then see how it develops. And when I check in with myself, I don't feel disgenuine or ungenuine. But I have a deep longing to be with other people who follow lineages, who, who want to develop spiritually. Um, so I, I didn't respond because I, I'm, really, I'm really thinking about it. I'm really reflecting on this question. Uh, and I don't really have an answer. I just, Thank you. And I think the process is the point. We don't have to have an answer right now. I mean, the fact that it triggers that, that depth of contemplation is the work itself. And it's a question that we continue to um, sit with as we teach and as we practice and answers evolve over time. And, and the, the answer might be different today than it was five years ago. And then it will be five years from now, and that's okay too. I think the fact that some folks respond to science and some folks respond to speaking to suffering um, allows us a broad umbrella under which to share the teachings. Because if we can even offer both, as we're spoken to both um, sort of avenues, we can touch different folks in the process. I think the other ethical concern for me is just like there are very many different emotional states and I've worked for decades as a therapist and I'm comfortable, let's say, with PTSD, trauma, this, that I'm, I, I know these emotional states. But with spiritual awakening, you know, people can go into unsafe places. I mean, I'm, I'm trauma trained, I understand that. They can go into spiritual niches with which I'm not familiar and I don't know if I could guide them. So that is another question for me, ethically. I'm so glad you brought that up because uh, a greater foundation in trauma sensitivity is one of the things that's a priority right now for the entire team. Um, and I think many of us share that uncertainty, you know, in the moment that uh, someone is really triggered in our meditation class, do we know what to do? Are we able to skillfully um, 
hold the space and make sure they receive the care that they need. When we're doing it online, it's that much harder. Um, so thank you for raising that because I, I think that's another key area that we need to really focus on. Um, you know, Jess has raised the idea of a community agreement in the past. Um, trauma sensitivity feels to me like it needs to be a baseline uh, training for all of our faculty so that we do feel more empowered and able to skillfully respond when and if that comes up. Because we know one in four women in our class have experienced trauma. So, um, you know, the numbers are, are, are clear that we're teaching folks who've been traumatized, especially after a pandemic. Um, so it's something we need to really turn our attention toward. Uh, I, I think one oh, ethical question that I wanted to make sure was dealt with is if if a, a student is having certain spiritual experiences, my point is I'm very used to trauma, so I'm not as upset if it happens. I, I feel like I have tools. It's not like I'm the master of the universe or anything. Mm -hmm. What really concerns me is I know that there are spiritual states, and they're different than emotional states, that... Um, a student could enter into, and I, they could have a bad experience, or I may not be able to lead them into a good experience because I may not have the a sufficient training to deal with certain spiritual awakening experiences, and I consider those to be different from when someone is trauma trauma triggered. Sorry, Jess, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, I was gonna say something a little, um, comment on something a little different. So I wanna make space if there's, to whatever Barbara Ann, not to give space for what Barbara Ann just brought up. Um, well, I just was going to reflect because I was listening to you, Barbara Ann, and when you were, um, this is backing up a little bit, and you were talking a little bit about why you practice, and uh, it occurred to me that like it was very uh, grounding for me to hear you talk about why you practice and why you uh, may use science sometimes as a foundational or a doorway rather, or um, your lineage and spiritual um, grounds as another doorway. And I wonder, I was like, you know, I wonder if that's, because I, I'm kind of struggling with like, well, what would I say in like a minute video or whatever um, for my profile? Like when it comes to naming my lineage and, you know, training and all this, and part of me is like, I don't even think I would like watch a video of me talking about that because half the time I don't, like it's nice to know where the training is. I do think it should live. Like I'm, I'm very much in favor of a tab for Studio B who we are. Like I do believe in that for sure, but I can read that. The video I may or may not click on to, like it's just, and because it's ever changing, I liked the way that you talked about it, Barbara Ann, because it felt like I was listening to your process, which made, I was like, it gave me like, oh, maybe I can just speak to that. Like right now, this is how it is. And also it resonated what you said about like, you know, the, the science is sometimes a really easy doorway for me too. And it, frankly, it's how I started to get into a more deeper training. And then, you know, of course it's like not something that keeps me, but um, anyway, I just, sharing that as a reflection because if anyone else is sort of also sort of like what would I say in this video and and just highlighting the process um being very grounding and healing to sort of listen to there's something too about when people are authentic about the suffering that led them to the practice because, you know, we always say you don't come to yoga and meditation because everything's peachy, right? You come because maybe you've got low back pain or you've got anxiety or um, 
there's something in your life that that hurts, or maybe you're suffering in in a less visible way. And um, I I always think of Dan Harris and how his willingness to be authentic and acknowledge that he had a a panic attack on air with Good Morning America um, has led to this you know massive explosion of mindfulness training because of his own experience um, and the way in which he suffered and mindfulness was able to to help him transform his experience of that suffering so perhaps hand in hand with an encouragement to share your lineage might be an encouragement if if this is the place you are in in terms of working with your uh, scars um, might be an opportunity to share what it was that led you to yoga and mindfulness or meditation or whatever your practices might be. Um, I'm in a space of sort of exploring what it is I'm trying to communicate. So be patient with me. Something that's coming up for me is um, when I'm creating content, I'm also, I'm all often thinking of like, who is my audience? Who is this for? And one thing that I see, because I'm also in everyone else's content on the platform, um, kind of on both sides, on the public side and also on the corporate side, is there's this desire to be really responsive to who's here right now, which means that we are developing a lot of short, um, sometimes like snippy micro practices which can be a doorway in for a lot of people. There's value for sure. But I wonder if, um, I sometimes feel like that's being tilted and I'm wondering where are the practices because I'm often craving, you know, my lineage, our practices are 90 minute and the first like 20 minutes are kind of settling and showing up the way we sort of did for this meeting. And where is the space for that on a platform where like, I often feel like I have, 60 seconds to get people in a practice or I lose them because they click away. So where are we developing for the content that for people that aren't looking for that five minute fix? Um, and, and are we, because for me in terms of authenticity, I can do both, but it is disingenuous for me only to do one of those and not the other because my personal lived practice is the deep long embedded practice that's often quiet and slow and takes time to get there. And that's where this tricky balance of serving corporate consumers, off, or many of whom are often brand new to these practices and need the five minute practices and serving the folks who want the 90 minute practice or you know, offering really important lineage rooted practices like Govinda's lead primary series. That is the source of so many of the other practices on our platform. That's essential that that be there. And, you know, I, I suppose capacity is a question here. Um, how much content are people actually, do people have the bandwidth to churn out and, and how much is being engaged with? Um, yeah, this is tricky. And I feel like it's one of those things that we can't solve overnight and it will evolve as our, our clients' needs demand. Um, I had a thought regarding naming lineage specifically. Um, and it's just that I don't think that it's incredibly important for most of the people that are gonna be engaging with us generally. Like, um, like you wouldn't have, like we don't, like like with, with names, for example, like last names, like we don't like name everybody in our lineage because there would be like 30 hyphens for like the last 200 years of our lineages. Um, so, you know, it seems like, like if you want to teach like history, then just create a course titled history. And, you know, I'm sure it'll get plays, you know? I'd like to respond, Jake, that was such a good comment about <clears throat> that really brought us into the probably minds of our audience for sure. But as a teacher, it feels so different. 
feels like I want to show up authentically and in order to do so, I want to acknowledge that I'm not a singular person, but I exist in this net or this mandala of teachers who came before me and by teaching in that moment, I'm inviting the audience member in and to not let them know exactly where I'm inviting them into is to me as a practitioner and a student in a particular lineage, um, uh, it, it is an act of my, my offending the lineage. So, um, so many different ways to do it, of course. I don't name all my teachers, of course. <laughs> I, um, I'll often name that, um, and I'd be curious, Jake, what you think about this and, and how it would land with people, but I'll often name maybe my primary teacher and then explain that um, their teachers, like what I'm able to do right now for you is um, due to the generosity and wisdom of my teacher so-and-so. And she received teachings from her teachers and they received them from their teachers going back several generations to the lands we now call Tibet, India, China, Sri Lanka, and Myanmar. And, and I'll say, and that is in the case of the lineages from which I teach. And then I might say specifically those you might hear of as Theravada early Buddhist um, and Tantric Buddhist. So that all probably took a minute. Um, for me, it helps me arrive and take my seat um, in a place where I feel I belong as long as I'm naming it. And I don't know. Does it feel like too much? Is it of interest? I think it's of interest, but maybe not in every place, you know? Like it would be like, like I want to, like, the, like we separate history from from math in school because it's they don't they don't have the same like they don't overlap perfectly or we, so we separate like mm -hmm. and maybe this isn't true for yoga and that's kind of you know what yoga is i guess but um you know we don't we separate history from from pe you know like because we yeah. want to have like a concise kind of feel so why not do it on on a platform like this where you have the opportunity to separate the two if you want to mm. yeah i guess the only thing i have to say about that is um from my perspective to separate the teachings from the teachers is whitewashing them particularly because i'm a white teacher and i'm teaching from lineages that um arose and were developed in asia so that's a piece of it yeah I think the placement idea is interesting because one thing that comes up for me is like in a workshop, I will often begin with a bit of an introduction and have that 60 seconds where I'm really kind of talking back through my lineage. And that makes sense in that placement. When I'm recording a 30 minute practice, you know, it's like every practice that I teach is informed by the way that integral yoga structures their asana practices. Every class that I teach ends with the collection of chants that we close with in the integral yoga tradition. But I don't necessarily know that it makes sense to place that same introduction in the beginning of every 30 minute practice or every 15 minute stretch break, even though it's structured and informed by that lineage. But I want it to live somewhere where people know like, that's why I'm closing with Lokasa Mastasuki no Bhavantu. That's why I close with Jai Shri Sakuru Maharaj Ki instead of you know, whatever other lineages might close with. So I struggle with placement, as I guess what I'm saying. And this is where it feels like it really circles back to what we were talking about at the top of the call, which is how do we respectfully and, and non-colonially share primarily Eastern teachings as a primarily white collective? And, and my concern is that the cultural appropriation comes in when we separate the lineage from the teachings and just offer the teachings without grounding them in um, 
an acknowledgement of their source. I would agree with that, Rachel. And also, um, and I think this speaks to the first question you gave us at the beginning of the hour, which was, well, I'm not gonna get it right. I don't remember it perfectly, but I think it was pointing to um, what happens when we don't name lineage. And one of the things that happens is that people don't know the lens through which they're being taught don't know maybe that all teaching is done through a lens inevitably. And some teachers think a lot about the lens and what in their teaching they are choosing to bring forth and choosing to leave behind because everything is a choice from the original lineage. And um, well, I guess I'll just put it there is that I, I don't want to put myself forward as someone who is teaching mindfulness with no lens. And so I also do a forgiveness, give forgiveness statement, um, um, knowing that inevitably um, I will make unconsciously some offenses and some harms to, to the lineage or to the students or both during my time. This yeah. is what Philip Moffat did so nicely in his interview with Sarah and Ty is he really st he spoke with them before the interview and asked them how they wanted to be um, called in terms of their own identities. And then once the interview had started right away, he said, I want to own any unskillful or ignorant speech. Um, if there is anything I say here that is not skillful, please reach out, I'm always learning. And I love that, you know, from this 70 something man who has been practicing for so long, who is a leader um, at Spirit Rock and beyond. It was such a great model of how to do that, you know, really gracefully. I, for me, for me the, the most powerful thing is the fact that we are asking these questions as a collective community and uh, that really goes to like, um, from my point of view, it's, it's like what's most important is just that we're, we continue to expand our awareness and that, um, you know, we continue to evolve both individually and, and as a group, you know, it's, <laughs> um, you know, you, we can, I think a lot of times, you know, in our, in our society, we get hung up on political correctness, we try, to do, uh, try to do the right thing. And that's difficult because you know, the environment in which we're talking or teaching is constantly changing. So it's difficult to know when to do the right thing. So it's important then, I think, to always return to the fact that the most essential thing is that we're aware, we're talking about it, we're facing difficult questions, we're acknowledging of difficult kind of issues that are arising in our culture with regard to mindfulness in this practice. But ultimately speaking, what is most powerful is that we're like not turning away from this about it. And we're continuing to see how we can evolve, you know, and as long as we're bringing, uh, you know, the weight of our awareness and we're continuing to evolve and face these things. And I think that basically that's where the real power is. You know, I mean, we're going to make mistakes. There's going to be moments when we're going to say things we shouldn't have said. We're going to do things we shouldn't do. You know, those things are always going to happen. But the main thing is to always return to the fact that you know, what we're all about, and this is my attraction to Studio B, is that it's genu genuine, like, it's our life, it's our practice, it's our way of being, is to, like, expand our sensitivity and awareness constantly, you know? I mean, this is a difficult situation, of course, but I think if we just, it's sort of like, you know, the, when they tell you in your teacher training, you know, there's all kinds of things that you can learn to do or not to do, but in the end, put most of your focus on coming from love, coming from concern, coming from awareness. And then that will, you know, it's not gonna prevent you from making mistakes, 
but it's going to kind of guide you and move you on in this direction that we want to go in. Thank you so much, Govinda. Mary, I know your hand was up. Oh, sorry, thank you. Um, I think there's two things that have come up a couple of times that I wanted to give space to, which was choice. They're offering, offering our, our clients a choice of looking at our community guidelines or looking at a lineage video. That's the choice that they can make and we're still honoring our, our history and we're acknowledging it's a collective um, all of our, our teachings have come in a collective environment. I, I understand it's not going to be fun to sit there and list like 200 years of lineage. It's not practical for a 15 minute class. But as Sarah Jane was pointing out, our teachings are because of those practices, and that's where we come informed from. So we are doing a disservice if we're not acknowledging what these practices are based in. That's just kind of the core of, if we're saying this is a movement class or this is a meditation class, we're explaining to them what this is that we're doing, even if it's 15 minutes, correct? Normally. Mm -hmm. So if we're especially taking care to make ourselves different and the reason we are revisiting all of this is because we do care and we are acknowledging that this is because of a collective which is why we're here with these people. Um, kind of like Martin Luther King saying, half the world's touched you before you've left your door every morning. And this is a constant reminder, you know, it's okay to acknowledge that. And in saying that, it might make someone feel seen that wasn't feeling seen before. By naming, we haven't gotten to where we would like yet for our diversity program. That makes me feel seen and heard. You know, by saying this is a lineage from an Eastern tradition for hundreds of years, that took five seconds. It's not detracting from what I'm teaching. And if we're not, if we're saying Chris Neff did this or Philip Mossett did that, what's the difference of saying that than where our lineage is coming from? Because they're well known. Dan Harris, those are buzzwords. So I'm just thinking, yes, they're skillful teachers and they're, but they're also, what Philip was saying was, I do this because of this, and I'm allowing you to do this because I learned this as well. So I, I really feel like we have to be very open in how we approach this and how we put it forward to our, even if it's um, a 15 minute class, we're still saying we're doing this because of this. So there's that room to say where it's coming from, especially when we know the clients we're meeting in the corporate side probably don't have any knowledge of what the practice is based in. So it's giving them a little snapshot of what and where, which I feel is so very important because that gets that curiosity going and that beginner's mind, which we all you know, cultivate in our practices. Yes, thank you so much, Mary. I'm thinking of this word lens that has popped up a little bit here and there. And it feels like that lens and the consciously diverse lens of the collective is also behind why we want to keep our eyes on this goal of uh, more representative faculty so that our teachers teach from a lens of their own lived experience which is deeply rooted in being alive in a body in the world. And when our teachers represent different experiences, then our students are, are better able to maybe see themselves reflected there as well. And we know that's important. Um, I just want to very briefly give you a couple of things to think about as I see we're four minutes from half past the hour remembering that all of these conversations will continue to just stay open as we move through them. Um, we have a few things coming up in the next few weeks 
that I would love to hear any um, inspiration that you might have um, so we can sort of co-create or source a Studio B's um, response to these. Um, right now it's Native American Heritage Month and we have posted about it um, last week and highlighted the interview we did with Sean and Lynn Taylor Corbett with their Broadway musical, then um, Distant Thunder. But I would like for us to do more than just offer that lip service. So if you have any ideas about how we might um, honor Native American Heritage Month, would love to hear them. Um, I'm also looking at the calendar and we have World AIDS Day coming up on December 1st and the International Day of Persons with Disabilities on the 3rd. So let those be um, sparks of inspiration. If, there's, if there is anyone or anything um, that comes to mind or someone's doing good work around these that you'd love to amplify, um, let me know because we would love to, to build some meaningful content around these things. And then I'm gonna jump down here to the last item on the agenda right now. Jen and I were just chatting about this today as we look toward the holidays coming up, um, looking at kind of an anti-gift guide that you could think of as a, a conscious gift guide, but it, as an alternative to buying plastic crap. Um, and would love to know if you have any nonprofits or um, activists that we could highlight in a blog post or a social media post about alternative ways in which people could gift experiences or donations or any kind of sort of a meaningful um, gift alternatives. So if you have anything that comes to mind, um, drop me a line and um, we would love to offer a, a different perspective on gift giving this, uh, this holiday season. Bail funds, great idea. And this is where it feels like we have an opportunity to really act in some practical ways. So it's beyond just talking about, yes, we're all interconnected, we're all interdependent, but here's one way that it can be tangible. Thanks, Barb. Have a good class. Soul Fire Farm. Great. So I'll keep a running list here. And if things come to you after we've finished meeting, you know, just drop me a line. And then we'll continue to move forward with, you know, grappling with some of these, these big questions about what it means to be a conscious mindfulness collective in the world. Anybody have any final thoughts? All right, well, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be here and to sit with these questions and to bring your full selves to the conversation. It's a treat and, and I look forward to continuing this conversation. Can I just ask Jake and Jess to stay back for just like one minute? Um, mm -hmm. And Rachel, if you need to bounce, you can reassign the meeting to okay. me. Okay, cool. Thanks everybody. I'm just gonna stop recording, Jyoti, okay? Thank you.